Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. This video is going to be all about mechanical traction. And the basic idea here is that you're pulling structures apart. So really it's more of a distraction if you're using it in the terms of the normal English language. It's really a distraction, but in medical terminology it's termed traction. So you're pulling two structures apart. And if you're doing this on the spine, as you apply traction, you're pulling those vertebrae apart, right? And you're creating more space in between those vertebrae. And so having a basic understanding of that is going to help us understand why we would use mechanical traction. So here's the five major indications for traction. The first is a spinal disc bulge or herniation. So you can see here, here's one of the lumbar vertebrae, here's the disc above it, and presumably there'd be a vertebra on top of it, right? And the disc here has bulged, it's herniated and is protruding it looks like posteriorly to the left, and it's compressing this nerve root, and that would potentially cause radicular symptoms, right? Well, if we apply traction, well, then the vertebra above it's going to sort of be pulled away from the vertebra below it, and it releases some of that pressure on this disc, and it creates a negative pressure that can potentially help to vacuum suck or pull that protrusion back in a little bit, and it will re relieve that pressure or compression on that cervical nerve root. So this can be used to decrease the size of a bulge of the disc or herniation, but it's possibly ineffective for a larger disc injury. So if the disc injury is small, it may be more effective. The second is spinal nerve root impingement, which is related to protrusion of the disc, but it also could be related to ligament hypertrophy, narrowing of that intervertebral foramen, or osteophyte formation. And you can see that right here. If you look at this intervertebral foramen above it, this one's pretty open and wide. This one looks a lot smaller, potentially because this disc is clearly desiccated, it's thinner. And so that leads to these bones being closer together, and so the intervertebral foramen is more narrow. And so it can potentially compress that nerve root, especially if there's osteophyte formation, so bone spurs uh, in the bones surrounding that nerve root. And so pulling these vertebrae apart with traction can relieve that compression on the nerve root. If there's muscle spasms, so the intermittent traction may inhibit alpha motor neuron firing. So the alpha motor neurons are of course what innervate those muscles, and so if you can inhibit those alpha motor neurons, you can relieve those muscle spasms. And relieving pressure on the pain generator will relax those protective muscle spasms again. Also, subacute joint inflammation. A big key here is that we don't do this on acute inflammation or acute injuries. It's got to be at the very latest subacute or sometimes even chronic. And distraction of inflamed joints has a pain gating effect and improves fluid dynamics. So we don't do it on acute, we only do it on subacute or potentially chronic. And then joint hypomobility. So this is where the intervertebral joints or the facet joints are hypomobile. Okay, they're not mobile at all. So distraction of the facet joints and stretching those soft tissues allows for greater mobility. I think that kind of makes sense. Those are the five major indications of why to use traction. What almost can be more important is when to not use it. So here's the contraindications. So obviously if motion is contraindicated, uh, you would not do traction. Uh, this could be due to an unstable fracture or a spinal injury that just happened or after a spinal surgery. Okay, obviously in those cases you would not do uh, mechanical traction. As we mentioned, we only do it for subacute inflammation, so if there's an acute injury or acute inflammation, the traction can actually exacerbate that injury or that inflammation and make it worse. So as a general rule, you want to wait at least 72 hours, so three days after that acute inflammation dies down before applying the traction. If there's joint instability, also known as hypermobility, it's also contraindicated. There's no reason to do traction if it's already too mobile. Okay? Remember, we do it if it's hypomobile, but if it's hypermobile, uh, we can cause an excessive increase in mobility, and that can actually cause injury. Also, if we're doing it on the cervical spine, we want to make sure that we verify lanoaxial integrity before traction. So that's that joint between C1 and C2. This is often uh, damaged or insufficient in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, Marfan syndrome, or Down syndrome, or even after a motor vehicle accident sometimes. And so if you're going to do traction on the cervical spine, 
you want to run some tests like uh, the sharp purser test, vertebral basilar artery insufficiency screen, just to make sure that this stuff is okay before you actually apply traction. Also, if there's pain peripheralization, but the key for this is during the treatment. So if you start traction and their pain peripheralizes, you're making it worse, so you need to stop the treatment. That can cause worsening nerve function and increased compression on the nerve. Also, if the patient has uncontrolled hypertension. So as a rule of thumb, if they have a blood pressure that's greater than 140 over 90, so basically if they're in stage 2 or greater hypertension, uh, this should be checked before and after traction. You need to monitor their blood pressure. And in general, during this treatment, the heart rate or blood pressure should not increase more than 10 units. So the blood pressure should not increase more than 10 millimeters of mercury during the treatment, and the heart rate should not increase more than 10 beats per minute. Okay. So it's better on a patient if the hypertension is controlled. Now for the precautions. So these are just more things to be careful. They don't necessarily preclude you from doing the treatment. But then there's structural spinal diseases. So weakened structures like the bones, either from osteoporosis, rheumatoid arthritis. Remember with rheumatoid arthritis, we can have weakening of that atlanoaxial joint and some of the ligaments that are in there. So if they have that issue at the C-spine, we could still do traction at the lumbar spine, but we just need to be careful if they have any kind of structural spinal diseases. And we always want to verify that atlanoaxial integrity before doing traction on the neck. And if belt pressure was harmful, so for example, in a pregnant patient, uh, you probably don't want to be doing lumbar traction, but you could potentially still do cervical traction or hiatal hernia, arterial issues, and understand that in patients with cardiopulmonary issues, the belt can impact breathing mechanics negatively. Also, if they have a displaced annular fragment. So if you know, potentially from an MRI, that they have a displaced annular fragment of their disc, um, the traction treatment is unlikely to help this, and it can actually even make it worse. If there's a medial disc protrusion, you can get increased compression with the traction treatment. Also, a medial disc protrusion can also compress into the spinal cord, so you want to make sure that they don't have that. Uh, you might be able to figure this out if they have an MRI done. If they have severe pain that fully resolves during treatment, that might sound good on the surface, but this is actually not good. When we apply traction, we're not expecting an automatic fix. This is not a silver bullet. Okay, it's going to take time. So if we're talking about pain that's like a 7 out of 10 or higher, so severe pain, and it goes away completely during the attraction, that probably more indicates that you've compressed a nerve and you have a nerve block. They're not getting any sensation from that area, and so of course they don't feel any pain. This is not a good thing. Also, if they have claustrophobia, any kind of psychological aversion to the treatment, any disorientation, uh, you also would not do this. Okay? If they have an inability to tolerate prone or supine position, again, you also would not do that particular position. So if they couldn't tolerate prone, you could still do supine, okay? And there are certain conditions where they may have decreased ability to tolerate these. Uh, spinal conditions or gastroesophageal reflux disease, in particular, they may not tolerate supine very well with this. And also, in these cases, positional or manual traction may be better because with these techniques, they don't actually have to be in supine or prone. They can be sitting or even standing. And also for cervical traction, if they have TMJ problems, so temporomandibular joint, the jaw, right, or they had dentures, um, then we want to modify how we're doing the cervical traction and use only an occipital harness instead of a halter around the jaw in those individuals. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.